America's online Irish station, Radio Irish, that's what you're listening to. Sean McCarthy here as we commemorate the centenary of 1916 and the Easter Rising. As we reflect on the lives of all those brave men, women and children involved in the Rising itself during Easter week 100 years ago this year, an event which is generally regarded as having led to Ireland's independence some six years later in 1921. We'd like to welcome to Radio Irish to chat with us about an informative and fascinating website, www.storiesfrom1916.com and its sister website, www.1916film.com, Irish actor and creative director Colin Farrell and his father, film producer Dave Farrell. How are you, Colin and Dave? Very good, thank well, you, Sean. We're very good, uh, Sean, thank you. Well, we're here 100 years later commemorating in this centenary year 1916 and the Easter Rising with your remarkable project Stories from 1916.com contributing to that commemoration. How did this website come about, Colin? Well, um, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to watch uh, the film we made called A Terrible Beauty, um, obviously taken from the WB Yeats poem. Um, it was a, obviously a 1916 uh, film that we made um, focusing on the two most ferocious battles that happened during Easter week on either side of Dublin City, uh, one uh, on the south side being Mount Street Bridge and on the north side, North King Street. Um, and what we did with that was a little unusual in, in number one because we didn't focus on the GPO like most documentaries do but, but the second thing about that was that we wanted to tell the story from the ground up as opposed to the top down so instead of um, focusing on the leaders of the rising as most documentaries tend to do um, we we wanted to focus on the ordinary soldiers so what we did was we gathered up first-hand accounts, not just from Irish volunteers, but also British soldiers and the civilians who were caught in the middle, um, because their story is, is one that is, isn't told too often either and still isn't. Um, and so that, that's a very brief description of the film, but, but once we... Um, once we made that film and it went out on TG Cahar, the TG4, the Irish language channel at home, um, a lot of families, you know, the way we made it, it resonated with them, um, that it was all told from the ordinary soldier's point of view. And, you know, we saw that there was a lot more of these, you know, ordinary people's accounts of what happened during the rising that needed to be told. And that's where the Stories from 1916 project was born. Indeed, when working on the film, you uncovered a wealth of individual accounts from Irish volunteers, British soldiers and innocent civilians that had never before seen the light of day. Talk to me a bit, Dave, about that material. How did it come to you? Well, uh, in a number of ways, uh, John, I mean, the first thing was the the Bureau of Military History, which is part of the Irish Army, Somebody in their wisdom, which is fantastic, in the 40s and 50s, decided that they should take statements from participants. Um, And that was uh, primarily volunteers, uh, primarily uh, men and women, uh, from who were engaged in 1916. So that material was starting to become available, and we went into the Bureau, uh, and we waded through these statements. Subsequently, they went up online. And we identified key characters that we felt could tell the story in the film. Uh, On the the British side, we were given access to regimental records. And again, we went in and we were able to identify people who had given statements. So there weren't that many, uh, but who had given statements uh, of what, what happened to them during that week and where they were and what they were engaged in. And um, with the civilian stories, uh, most of those, again, were taken, were, were statements that were taken um, by the Bureau, I think, Colin, yeah. yeah. Um, I, actually, I think that was, that was uh, taken by the, um, the British authorities, um, because obviously at the time it was, uh, you know, we were still in the Empire, so to speak, so they would have been held, I believe, in the Imperial War Museum. 
Um, and, and like I said, that the, the civilian story is one that we're, we're we're kind of proud that we put it up on screen because still to this day, you know, it, it, like the women's story in 1916 that was forgotten about for many years is, is coming back to life now in a big way. Um, but the civilian story is still kind of one that a lot of people don't really focus on. So we thought felt it was very, very important to tell their side of the story. And there are some great accounts that were left behind. So just to, to finish on that, uh, Sean, so what we did was we identified the key characters that we wanted to be the avatars, to be the storytellers for the uh, film, uh, and then we used their statements, uh, their written word, to drive the narrative for the film. So in the film itself, where you see a character, an actor playing a particular person, speaking their words, we would then turn to that particular piece of action, whatever that might have been. So that's how that came about. I love it. You went straight to the source of the information. Now, A Terrible Beauty, written and directed by your son, Keith Farrell, uh, produced by yourself, Dave, and uh, Colin there playing a role in the film, has been very much a Farrell family project. How was that, Dave, to work on this together as a family? Um, well, the, the first thing is that we, 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 we kind of all come from slightly different uh, backgrounds. You know, I, I, I wore a suit for 25 years and then changed career a couple of times. Um, Kate uh, went to um, film school, as did uh, Colin. Uh, but Colin, I think it would be fair to say, was you were more on the kind of sound engineering, uh, film production side of it. So we were working individually uh, as well as... as uh, collaborating on projects, because this isn't the only one that we've done. We did another one for PBS uh, called The Ghosts of Duffy's Cut, and subsequently a second documentary called Death on the Railroad, where all three of us, again, were involved. So it's been kind of been great for me to be able to work with, uh, with my two sons um, on these projects, you know. Now, A Terrible Beauty tells the story of the Easter Rising from three different perspectives, uh, through first-hand accounts from ordinary people involved in the Rising, uh, Irish volunteers, British soldiers and the innocent civilians caught up in the middle, children among them. Why was it important to you to deliver this 360-degree perspective, so to speak, from all sides, Dave, and not just from the volunteers' viewpoint? Um, I, you know, there was great heroism, there was great idealism attached to uh, the events of 1960, and in particular the need of the, the, the cultural revival that was taking place prior to that. But but we didn't want to, to make a, you know, a, a Michael Collins type uh, movie, you know, and history is not a one-sided, uh, it's not one-sided, and it shouldn't be one-sided. Um, so, we thought this had never really been done before. It, it, there, were, there, were, there was always a kind of a skewed approach to 1916, um, and it needed to be uh, balanced, more balanced. And uh, that's why we felt that audiences wanted to see, I think the timing is right. We tried to make this 20 years ago. I think we might have got a, a completely different reaction uh, from a lot of people. But people think that this film is of its time, that, that it is important to, uh, t to, to provide a balanced uh, look at events, uh, historical events. So that's what we try to do. Well, getting onto the sister website, storiesfrom1916.com, it was back in September last we received an email here at Radio Irish from your production company, Tile Media in Dublin, about your latest project, storiesfrom1916.com which was calling for the families of all those involved in the Easter Rising to come forward and share their stories. Uh, what was the initial response to that public invitation like, Colin? Well, as you can imagine, you know, um, <clears throat> not just in, in, in Ireland, but in, in the US too, there's a, a great deal of interest in this, this whole time period, the revolutionary period, kind of 1912 to 22. 
Um, so we had an awful lot of emails from people <clears throat> that wanted to share their stories and also wanted us to give them a bit of a handout in terms of, you know, researching and see if there were things that we could find out that hadn't been uncovered before. So there was a really great response to it. It's, it, it's funny, you know, how these things come about. As I said, it was never really intended, um, you know, on, on our part to do this project. But when they when the story did start, uh, start coming to us, we felt it was very important to tell them. And funny enough, the first one was um, was the complaint actually that came from a family. Um, in the film, uh, we tell uh, the story of Mount Street Bridge and Clan William House. And there's only four survivors that, that get out of Clan William House in 1916. Two of them are brothers, uh, Jim and Tom Walsh. There was a guy called Willie Ronan and uh, James Doyle, who we feature in the film. But the family of uh, Tom Walsh got in contact with us. I think initially, you know, they were quite excited. As I said, you know, Mount Street Bridge is not a story that's well known and, and it doesn't get told very often in, in, in documentary or in film or, you know, that, that kind of form. And so I think they would have been quite excited to see that this was finally coming onto the screen. And when they didn't see their, their relatives um, in the film, so to speak, because you can only, as you said, focus on one, one character and uh, tell each kind of story of each, uh, each particular um engagement uh, they, they were probably initially a little bit disappointed but, but actually more than that it was in James Doyle's statement um, he, he talks about um, the chaos that's happening when Clan William House is starting to burn and starting to fall down and um, so he um, he says in the statement you know he's talking about the commander George Reynolds lying in a pool of blood with Tom Walsh lying beside him now these are directly taken from his words and he um, you know that 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 you could take to mean that, that Tom Walsh had died and in fact he didn't he, he, he went on to live a life and, and, and raise a family so they got in contact with us you know and, uh, and we said look we understand that that could have been taken that way and we apologise um, you know that that you were disappointed um, but we'd love to hear more about your story so we went up to visit um, Aileen his, his daughter who lives in Belfast now and we uh, we went. We said we'd love to hear more about it. So we went up to visit her and, and, and her family. And they and, and we've you know we've become friends with them. We actually interviewed them not too long ago, and that led into you know many many more people. Well, we we decided that it was an important project to do, and many more people kind of getting in contact with us on this side of the Atlantic. It, it, you know, there's a very interesting story to tell as well. As I'm sure your listeners know, and it was really interesting. I was trawling through the archives, the Bureau of Military History. Um, uh, witness statements online and I was looking for guys that weren't listed as soldiers so to speak and I came across the, one of them uh, that was listed as the IRB's transatlantic ca- uh, courier a guy called Tommy O'Connor so when I started looking into Tommy O'Connor a little bit more and I went through the pension records which are also online in the pension records there was um, a note uh, a letter a court and official kind of letter that, that, that was in there and when I read through it, I was amazed to find out that it was actually a presidential pardon for Tom, um, from Calvin Coolidge um, for Tommy O'Connor. Um, and what happened there was, you know, in 1917, Tommy O'Connor, you know, he's going back and forth constantly with money and, and, and secret coded messages between New York and, and the States and Ireland. Um, and eventually he's picked up getting off a ship and um, he'd been to Germany as well, so obviously America's in the war at that stage, and uh, and Tommy is kind of charged with trading with the enemy or something something similar to that. And uh, for a long time, the the case was going through the the, the system right up to the Supreme Court, but eventually in in twenty two, he actually ends up going to um to to prison in Albany, and eventually years later, it's nineteen twenty, excuse me, um, eventually years later um, Tommy O'Connor you know he's working in Macy's at this stage and uh, he obviously it's not a very good thing to have a felony charge on your record so I presume through his, his political uh, associations he, he manages to get this this presidential pardon from Silent Cal I like believe he was known that so it wasn't something that he was he was doing that often but, but interestingly enough and this is where kind of serendipity comes into it you know I brought this letter into into my dad um, this presidential pardon and, and we were saying well this is a fascinating story we'd love to find this family and, and, and you know literally a day later 
Ellen Eisenstein uh, and us off in St. Louis now, and we, we just come from St. Louis, uh, got in contact with us. Uh, so it was just amazing that, you know, this was happening. So it felt like it was right, you know, that it was meant to be, I guess, that, that this was happening. I mean, a day later after we uncovered this guy, a family member across the other side of the world gets in contact with us, and it was really fascinating. And, and that's when we, uh, we produced a 20 minute short documentary called The Courier's Tale, uh, which is online up on Stories from 1960. Com. And, uh, you know, there's just, there's so many of these, we can't even keep up to it, uh, keep up with the demand to tell these stories from the families. There's a yearning to tell them because they haven't had a chance before to tell their stories. Now, Stories from 1916.com tells the little-known tales of ordinary men and women leading up to, during and after the rising through short video documentaries, weekly audio podcasts and articles is it accurate to say that many of these incredible stories would never have been heard before in public, uh, Dave, apart from perhaps within the family circles in which they're told? Is that, that, that's absolutely correct, Sean. Um, you know, uh, the, the, one thing, the one thing that spurs us on to keep going with this uh, is the fact that families have come to us and said, look, what you're doing for our family is really fantastic. Now, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or call and pat, pat himself on the back and saying that, but it's giving people who, who didn't have a voice uh, a way to tell family stories. And of course, if you if you were to look at any of these men and women in the context of those six days of, of that uh, revolution in 1916, it's a very one-dimensional picture. So what we have, you know, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're we're, we're helping the family to tell a more grounded story, to tell a story of, to tell a family story which, in which their ancestor, you know, had a huge role to play in the spark that, that led to uh, independence in Ireland. Um, but also to um, tell the story in a way that, that, uh, um, that you know, that it, that it goes through the generations if that makes that that it's a, a son or a grandson or a granddaughter or a daughter is participating in this and telling their part of that story about this person's life. So it's a it's a real buzz. It's a real rewarding uh, project that we've got here. You know, and, and and I think it's interesting, Sean, that you mentioned that you know we do video, we do podcasts, and it's 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 an online resource as such, and that was important to us too because. I mean, all our history is, is no new thing, you know, and, and we don't claim it to be, or we're doing nothing from that regard, revolutionary, but um, it was important to kind of modernize that. A lot of oral histories that have gone before are purely interview-based, long, long interview-based kind of things that you might find, and, and you know, it's great, a lot of them going up online, but we wanted to kind of bring it in, into the, the 21st century, if you want to call it that, and that's why it was important to kind of have a multimedia project, and... Um, and that's why we took the approach of doing things like a weekly audio podcasts, which are only, you know, 10 minutes long, shorter in some cases. And it's very digestible for people. They can listen to it on their, their phone, you know, on their way home from work or whatever. And the video elements, and, and especially, uh, I, I thought this was very important to, to go down this route too. And we have an exhibition, the traveling exhibition, um, Stories from 1916 exhibition that we travel around with, and we've done it here a number of times in, in the U.S., most recently in the Missouri History Museum in St. Louis last weekend. Um, and in, in that, it, we, we take the same approach where we have a screen and projector that's showing all our, our, our videos. We've got uh, iPads that we use where people can flip through the stories, look at the, the, the interviews we've done with family members, listen to the podcast, as well as the, the traditional kind of um, material that you find on the wall. So the, the, I'm glad you kind of mentioned that it was a, a multimedia project because that's very important to the, to the ethos of the project as well, I think. There's a wealth of audio podcasts on stories from 1916.com that I find particularly informative and intriguing with specially produced videos that are full of accuracy and detail. What can people do if they too have a story to tell? Well, I think initially just to get in contact with us, you know, it, it, it's great nowadays, communication and so 
easier as well, you know, with email and how well the phone systems are and all the rest. So, you know, if people want to get in contact with us, send an email directly to, to myself or Dave, uh, Colin at tilemedia.ie or Dave at tilemedia.ie. Um, and, you know, that's where most things start and that's where the seed is sown on these these projects. And once we, we start engaging with families, then we can figure out a way, again, modern technology helps us in this, uh, to be able to get people's stories told. So, in some cases, when we're making the podcast, we use actors that, that um, speak the words taken from the witness statements, um, padded with a little bit of narration that um, uh, I have to give credit to our, our, our man who, who does a lot of that work, he, he puts the podcast together. Um, so, you know, people just get in contact with us and we'll find out a way, whether it's an actor, but we especially like to have family members, you know, telling the story. So if there's a way that we can get the family member either into recording Dublin or maybe over the phone um, to record these podcasts, you know, that's the way we like to do it. In some cases, we've even had original recordings that we've been we've been able to use, um, which, which is great too. Um, but they're kind of the, you know, it doesn't happen so often, obviously, because, you know, there wasn't as many audio recordings taken. And um, at the time, but um, yeah, no, that's you know, just just give, drop us an email. We're very approachable. We love collaborating with people, and love love listening and hearing new stories and families, and that's that's the first step, I guess. Chris Sholdice, son of Irish volunteer Jack Sholdice, who fought at Riley's Fort during the 1916 Rising, tells the fascinating story of how his father ended up acquiring the captain's table from the British Royal Navy ship the HMY Helga, which, with her pair of 12-pounder naval guns, shelled Liberty Hall in Dublin during the Easter week of 1916. Is there any particular kind of quality uh, you keep an eye out for, Dave, when choosing the stories to include on the site? Um, yes, I think the, I think the, the answer is probably, is probably yes. Um, there's only so much we can do, so... You, you know, typically in in, in uh, most families, there's at least one person who really kind of becomes the historian for that family, or has that great interest in genealogy or whatever. Um, so, you know, if it, it, it's if it's very vague and we can't uh, authenticate. Um, uh, stories. It makes it much more difficult. It, it doesn't mean that we won't go and try and help that family to to source material. But yes, uh, you know the quality of of um, Chris Rice's storytelling uh, in the, in the context of both the film and uh, the uh, subsequent work we've done with Chris um, has been hugely important, and it, it it brings because of the work he's done. Um, uh, it brings a, a completely, you know, a, a better, a greater dimension, a greater quality to it. Uh, and he's a lovely storyteller. He's a great storyteller himself. As, as they said, I mean, it, it, we can only do so much. We're, we're a small company, just the two of us, really, and a couple of a couple of people that help us back home. Um, and that has an impact on on what we're doing too. Uh, unfortunately, really, I mean, you know, with a bigger team, we we could do more research and and, and that kind of thing, but. You know, and that's why it's it's great when someone like Chris comes to us and has a huge amount of research done themselves. It makes our job a lot easier in, in telling the story, both the written word and then the subsequent podcast or, or, or video material. Um, you know, in the States here, we're lucky enough to have uh, 501c3 status through, through a physical sponsor. Um, and, you know, even just being able to raise the small amounts of money that, that we have so far is very important because... Unfortunately, at home, we, we haven't managed to, to get the government to, to, uh, to fund the project, which we, we would have hoped to. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is really great when some families can, can come to us and, uh, and have a good amount of that done. And especially visually, if they have photographs and, you know, that kind of thing or memorabilia, it, it's fantastic for us. And it, and it just brings that extra dimension um, to to the project. I mean, Chris, we, we've done the captain's table. We've also done a piece, which I'm, which I'm sure you've seen, called The Prison Letters of Jack Shoulder. And these are letters that Chris had that his father had sent from Lewis Jail um, you know, uh, after his incarceration after 1916, you know, to have these letters in my hands 
it was just amazing to me, you know, these letters that this man had to write from prison in tiny, tiny amount of, uh, tiny, tiny writing because they were only allowed one kind of page a month and back home, you know, that kind of archive material. It's museum quality, although if you gave it to a museum, there's a good chance it might end up in a vault somewhere. So, you know, it, 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 that's another element of the project is, is you know, helping the families to preserve this kind of um, material too uh, and to present this to, to the public. So that's, you know, it, it is great. The more the, the, the more the merrier, as they say, so the more that, 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 that someone, you know, the families can provide us, the better story that we can tell, I guess. And, and that's definitely the case with Chris. Incidentally, the ship, the Helga, was later purchased by the Irish Free State in 1923 and renamed Murakou, Irish for Hound of the Sea. She sank off the Wexford coast... After disposal in 1947, the ship's steering wheel was recovered from the wreck by local divers and can now be seen in Kyo's pub in Kilmore Quay in County Wexford. Stories from 1916.com also features a remarkable video of Williams Rossa Cole, the great-grandson of Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, discussing his great-grandfather and his own journey of discovery while making a documentary on the life of one of Ireland's most revered Fenians. In the video, Williams says that he would like his great-grandfather to be remembered as one of those people that really put his life out there and had a consistent view of fighting oppression and tyranny and of wanting equality for all people, all religions, all races. That statement struck me as being at the heart of the ongoing journey that Ireland is on these past 100 years since 1916, equality. Would you agree, Dave, that Ireland is still on that journey for social equality? I think it is, and I have a kind of a personal view, which was that uh, uh, we didn't quite get the independence that we wanted in, in 1923, and I don't mean by that, uh, you know, a partition country. Uh, unfortunately, the Conservatives took over, um, firstly with W.T. Cosgrave and then subsequently with De Valera. And, um, you know, Ireland became quite a repressive place, and I'm delighted to see that kind of change that's taken place in the last, uh, you know, 20, 20 years in particular, where we're becoming a secular society. Maybe this is something that people don't want to hear, but, you know, we're becoming a, a secular society. Um, uh, there's an acceptance of, of uh, uh, you know, the gay the gay, the gay uh, marriage equality, um, which was the first uh, referendum, I think, that took place worldwide because it was a huge interest. It was press all over the place. But, uh, I probably hadn't even been allowed, but, you know, for me, that uh, 100 years, the last 100 years, is about, what is happening now uh, it's about uh, the evolution we've grown up as a country I think and, and it's great to see it and I'm of a generation uh, who, who kind of lived you know as a, as a child in the 50s and six, early 60s so uh, I still remember the kind of the tail end of that kind of repressed uh, society I'm not sure if that answers the question Sean but uh, you know it's, it's uh, yeah I'm, I'm proud of I'm proud of the fact that we have evolved into what we are now. Yeah, I think it, it's interesting that actually, you know, a hundred years later, you know, coming up to the centenary, and it's only now really, well, I know it's been, it's been building for a time, obviously, but it's, now you can really see that Ireland is changing. You know, even, um, I'm, I'm 33 myself, so even, you know, my friends and the attitudes that have shifted so much, even from the time in high school, you know, it, it, it's amazing to see Ireland is changing so much in terms of different nationalities uh, co coming into uh, the country. Um, and it, that's harking back to, uh, you know, to the proclamation, really, uh, and to, which was, which was based on things that came before, like, like, um, O'Donovan Ross's kind of, um, the way he thought, you know, equality for all, and, and that's really, really important. We didn't have equality for all, and we, we still don't to, to to getting there. So it's nice to see that, you know, in 2016, the, the centenary of 1916, when 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 those men and women went down and fought for what they believed, and that finally we're starting to see the, the, the fruits of, of of their labor, if you if you want to call it that, I guess. 
Well, Stories from 1916 was recently nominated for the Kieran Hegarty Award for Innovation at this year's Celtic Media Festival, which will take place in Dungarvan, County Waterford, from the 20th to the 22nd of April, plus a number of other awards and nominations. What does it mean to yourself and all the team behind the website, Colin, to be nominated and uh, to be receiving such recognition for the work involved in the website? Well, you know, we're just delighted that, that we are getting that recognition. We've kind of, I don't want to use the word struggle really, but we kind of have for the last couple of years to keep this going uh, with, you know, self-funded um, and, and not receiving any uh, any funding from the government or, 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 or otherwise. We're very lucky, as I said, to, to take in some, some small donations from people. But, but um, you know, to, to get that kind of recognition at a festival that's very prestigious is... It, it, it means the world to us, you know, to see that people, you know, we, we know people get in contact with us, and particularly the families, it's really nice to see that. But but when you get a kind of a nom- nomination for an award, like it's it's a really it, it's really an endorsement of, of what we're doing, and um, and you know it. it it, 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 that's one of the few festivals that we've actually entered the project into and you know we were, we were actually putting in a short film that we made called Jubilee Nurse um, into that and it was almost an afterthought because you know there's not many avenues for for, for a project like this to, to get that kind of recognition I think you know there's lots of film festivals around the world and, you know but for this kind of project it's something different so I think the care on heck uh, really fits what we're doing uh, and you know I'm delighted I'm actually you know I re- we're going to be in, in NYU next month um, to screen A Terrible Beauty and we're doing a seminar on, on Tommy O'Connor the, the transatlantic courier um, I actually rearranged the flight so I would be home on the the, the, the morning of when that award is going to be uh, kind of going to be announced, and I'm going to get to make my way down to Dungarvan in some sort of bedraggled state. Um, but you know, it's very important for me to be there, not because I think we're going to win necessarily, but just to be there, to, you know, to represent what we're presenting the project. Well, we all have our history books, which outline the events leading up to, occurring during, and following the Easter Rising. But there is so much more to the overall story of 1916 and the Rising. Does our past tell us something about our present, Dave, and perhaps even our future, do you think? Oh, I, oh, I think so. I, I, it, <coughs> you know, I, people say, well, you know, I'm not interested in, in history, I'm not interested in what happened a hundred years ago. Um, but we are, we, without sounding... <laughs> Professor Tosorial or whatever the expression is, we are uh, we are molded by by uh, our past lives, and in my opinion, uh, are molded by events that have happened in previous generations. Um, and I think the events of 1916. I think people are are, are there's an awakening uh, uh, as a result of uh, the commemoration of 1916. And a kind of a, uh, an awareness that that uh, we are a people who have come out of oppression, and also there's a lesson there that we need to be very careful not to become an oppressor as well. So yes, I think uh, I think it has meaning in 2016, but I think people need to reflect. And I'm beginning to sound like one of those government pamphlets, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, people, people need to reflect on the kind of society that they want to live in, uh, what the meaning of the program. The proclamation itself is an amazing statement, and um, I, I'd like to think that we, 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 we keep returning to it to remind ourselves of what, uh, you know, our founding fathers of modern, you know, modern Ireland, uh, if you want to call it that, um, what they died for. Indeed. And Stories from 1916, as you were mentioning there, Colin, is a 501c3 non-profit educational project run in partnership with the Chicago Irish Brotherhood with 100% of tax-deductible contributions here in the United States going directly towards the costs associated with the research, the development and presentation of these vital individual stories of the ordinary men and women who did extraordinary things during the 1916 Easter Rising. What can people do around the world, Colin, to contribute to the to this incredible project? Well, they, 
you know, they can, um, the easiest way, I suppose, if they want to, to make a donation is, is through our website. There, there is a link um, to, to participate in the project on storiesfrom1916.com, and that, can, that will take you into an area, um, you know, where if you want to, you can contribute uh, directly uh, to the project. As you said, at Ock into it, we've, we've spent a lot of our own money kind of funding this up to now because we thought it was so important. But... You know, like we said, we can only do so much without a, a level of funding. So, you know, we really, really appreciate every every time that, that someone, you know, goes to stories from 1916.com and makes a donation. You know, if they want to email us, um, if that system doesn't work for them, um, you can email again, myself, Colin, at pilemedia.ie, and we can arrange some other way of doing it. We, we have some fundraising um, that we do where, you know, people have been very generous and given us checks um, and that kind of thing. And, you know, if people are interested in, you know, maybe having a fundraising event here, in, 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 you know, if we can make it happen, uh, we, we, we'd love to make it happen so we can actually show people firsthand what they are contributing to by bring, bringing the travelling exhibition. Um, and that's really important because although it's called Stories from 1916, we're really uh, covering that whole revolutionary period before and after um, and we're, we hope to continue to, to, uh, to do that um, not just this year in 2016 but next year and, and beyond um, and that's you know we can only do that with the help and, and the support of, of you know people um, ordinary people just like the ordinary people that were, that, that were out fighting in, uh, in, in 1916 so you know we're, we're very pleased to have the, the 501c3 status in the US um, and it, that, that's you know that's a really important thing for people. I know it's, you know at home we don't have a similar one, unfortunately. But but here in the US, it's very important to have five hundred one c three. So we're you know we're indebted to, to the Chicago Irish Buller for for being a physical sponsor. But I mean even the endorsement from them that they saw that our project was worthwhile for them to support us, it, it, you know, is it, an endorsement again for us and what we're doing. Well, we look forward to sharing the links to the websites that you were involved in, Dave and Colin and Keith, as we commemorate 1916, 100 years on in this centenary year and the Easter Rising here on Radio Irish. I want to thank you both for coming along and chatting with me here on Radio Irish today. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you, Sean. We really appreciate it. Um, it, it, it's been great talking to you. It was a very interesting conversation. Colin and Dave Farrell there, and what a brilliant chat with father and son. And I'd say there's going to be some considerable interest in getting that exhibition here to New York City so that the Irish community can enjoy it and gather socially to witness the artefacts, the exhibits, first hand materials, and the accounts of the Easter Rising for themselves. I love going to an exhibition and meeting people and chatting about the various discoveries on display, don't you? That would be an interesting exhibition to put on here in New York, and we look forward to it arriving in the city at some stage. And you can visit www.storiesfrom1916.com for all the details, or the film's website, 1916film.com This is Sean McCarthy for America's online Irish station, Radio Irish. Live from New York City, RadioIrish.com Hi, this is Colin Farrell and Dave Farrell of the Stories from 1916.com project and you're listening to RadioIrish.com